A good ner of Shabbos. There are so many rich and deep facets to the story of Joseph's reconciliation with his brothers that takes place in this week's Parsha, Vayigash. There's so much contained in the sparse words of the text, so we look to the Torah Shabbat Alpeh, the oral Torah, to fill in the background and the stories behind the story. We'll meet Serach Bat Asher by name in next week's Parsha, when the lineages of each uh, tribe are listed, but this week, Serach's voice is heard in the account of Sefer HaYashar, which explains her role in bringing Yaakov's family back together again. As we remember, Yaakov was inconsolable over the 22 years that Yos since Yosef had disappeared. He had no closure, and his mourning went on and on. When his sons returned from Egypt to tell him the news that, in fact, his intuition was correct all along, and Yosef was, in fact, alive, uh, and was the vo- viceroy of all Egypt, uh, the sons also feared that the news would overcome Yaakov and might uh, damage his, harm his health. They decided to send Serach, daughter of Asher. She was a beautiful harpist and singer, but she did not play her harp in Yaakov's house out of respect for her grandfather's extended grief. Now, though, she picked up her instrument and played a sweet tune and gently sang the news that Yosef was alive and well. She sang the refrain a few times until it started to sink into Yaakov's mind. In this way, Yaakov was able to absorb the news in a gentle way, and in appreciation, he blessed his granddaughter with long life. More on that in a moment. Yaakov felt better as his spirits rose, and at this point, his sons came into the room with their own report of their meeting with their long-lost brother, bringing a message uh, to their father, which only Yosef could, himself could have conveyed, and this was all the proof that he needed. At that point, he said, V'yomer Yisrael, Oid Yosef b'nichai, my son Joseph is still alive, Elcha v'erenu b'terem amus, let me go see him while I'm still alive. Yaakov was so overjoyed, and particularly in the sensitive way that his granddaughter, Serach, helped him handle the news, he blessed her that, the mouth which informed me that Yosef is alive will not taste death. From all the progeny mentioned in next week's Parsha, Serach is the only granddaughter, and as we'll see, she had quite an extended and uh, very significant life. It's not simply happenstance because of her musical talent. More than that, Serach made the most of her longevity, and she became the link in the chain that transmitted the Masora, the tradition, of Moshe Rabbeinu as the leader when God delivered us out of Egypt after two centuries of slavery. She was alive when we descended into Mitzrayim. She was alive when we came out. Shmois Rabbah, the Medrash on Exodus, tells us that God let Yaakov know, and Yaakov passed this knowledge on to Yosef, Yosef to the brothers, among them Asher, who told his daughter Serach, the important critical knowledge that the person who used the phrase Pakod Yifkod Elokim Eschem, God will surely remember you. That's the person who will lead the Jews out of Egypt. So when Moshe came years later and gave indicators of his fitness for leadership, the elders turned to Serach and they asked her if indeed this was the Redeemer to, to end the Egyptian exile. She heard their report and she said, nope, this seems not to be the one. But then they added, he did say the words Pakod Yifkod Elokim Eschem, And she said, oh, that is the Redeemer. He's the one. In other words, Serach knew the password to identify the leader of the Am. And she had useful esoteric knowledge to boot. When it came to to, uh, time to leave Egypt, Moshe was searching for Yosef's bones because the vow had been taken not to leave Yosef's body in Egypt, but to take them with him, with us, when we left. Uh, If you ever saw the King Tut exhibit or visited the mummies in the British Museum, you know those Egyptians were quite talented at burying their dead with great fanfare and artisanry. But Moshe couldn't find Yosef's remains until Serach took him to the Nile and showed him the place where they had put Yosef in a metal sarcophagus and lowered it into the water. Mechilta says that they threw in an amulet with the words, Alei Shor, arise over the wall, which was part of the blessing that Yaakov gave, gave Yosef at the end of his life. And the casket floated to the top, and they retrieved it. Yosef, you may know, is buried in present-day Shechem. Serach is mentioned again in Chumash Bamidbar in the census of Bnei Yisrael, and a most interesting mention of her is made in Pirkei de Rebbe Eliezer, wherein Rabbi Yochanan is trying to imagine how it looked 
uh, how were the waters of the Yamsuf? What did they look like when they split? And he explains, according to his understanding, it looked like a sort of a net somehow. So Pirkei de Rebelezer explained that Serach Bat Asher heard this and she corrected him. She said, I was there and I can tell you what it looked like. It looked like transparent windows. So evidently she remained alive for many centuries. Some say she was one of those very few who entered Gan Eden without dying first. On the same topic of the Jewish people having exactly what we need, thanks to God's providence, there's another fascinating story for those listening closely to what's overt and what's implicit. In Parshas V'yigash, the census uh, of B'nai Yisrael as we descend into Egypt is described as having Shivim Nafesh, 70 souls. However, if you count the names, you keep track, you'll find 69 all told. How do you work out the math? Some say the one is the divine presence. Some say Yaakov himself is counted among his children. Others say Dina had a twin sister. But the Gemara in Baba Basra, in a conversation about birthrights and firstborns, which leads to a discussion of Yaakov's family, says Abba Khalifa asks Rabbi Chia Bar Abba why there is 70 minus 1 in the accounting of our parsha. Chia Bar Abba offers what he, what's it said is a pearl of wisdom in answering. The 70th person, the 70th soul, is Yocheved, the mother of Moshe. She was conceived on the trip into Egypt and born Bein HaChomers, it says, between the walls, meaning once we were already in Egypt. The, that the Torah draws our attention to Yocheved's birth in such a way suggests to us several points that are really elements or fundamentals of Jewish faith. One of those is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Makdim Rafu Alamakeh, God precedes the illness with its cure already. Even before we know what we need, we have it, even if we don't realize it yet. Take a look at the Jewish calendar, and you'll notice that the first night of Pesach is always the same day of the week as Tisha B'Av. As if to say, although there are elements of life, such as exile and distance and wandering, we have already tasted freedom, redemption, and liberation. So no matter what we're forced to endure by life's tribulations, at the deepest levels, we already possess what it takes to endure and not only keep going, but to keep going forward and keep going well. Yocheved's part in the unfolding drama of B'nai Yisrael's liberation wouldn't even begin to flower until decades later, some say many decades later, when she gave birth to Moshe, sent him down to the river to be rescued by Pharaoh's daughter, where he grew up as a prince of Egypt and became Israel's liberator. Yet even as the exile began, the mother of Moshe Rabbeinu entered into the picture. Which also says something about the essence of Jewishness. Someone joined our minion for the first time this week. He apologized for not knowing how to daven. He didn't know how to put on tefillin. He said, he said I'm sorry, I'm just a Jew. The thing he didn't realize is that, is that first, there's nothing to apologize for. Second, being a Jew is the whole thing. The fact that he is a Jew does the trick. Thanks to him, we had a minion that day. Yocheved was a newborn. She couldn't daven. She was in no position to start uh, birthing future redeemers or really do much of anything at all for that matter. But the very fact of her existence brought the total, of, uh, total number of B'nai Yisrael up to 70, parallel to the 70 nations of the world, which we learned about back in Parshas Noach and on whose behalf the future B'nai Yisrael would bring offerings on Sukkot. It underscores the point that while it's good that someone does good things with their days and with their years, there's a level at which we appreciate a fellow Jew not just for what she's achieved or what she's published or amassed or said or sang. The very fact of being Jewish means everything. Every Jew is precious, no matter what they may or may not accomplish in life. Yocheved's presence in this story, even as a newborn, emphasizes this. In the future would come the day with many trials and tribulations uh, of the oppression of the Jewish people in Mitzrayim and the anxiety over having children. Who could bring children into such a cruel world, people thought, in the, back in those ancient times. But all this was in the future, as, uh, as was Yocheved's giving birth to Miriam, Aaron, and Moshe. Her very presence itself brought a completion, a shlemus to Bnei Yisrael, to say nothing of what was to come later on in her life. Moreover, as Ramban Nachmanides points out, there are miracles and then there are miracles. Part of Amuna, part of Jewish faith, is appreciating that it all comes from the source. Everything originates in God, whether it comes to us via what we consider to be nature 
or through what we see as supernatural processes. In God's infinite wisdom, God chooses to emphasize some things as manifestly circumventing nature, like the splitting of the sea or the angels announcing to Sarah that she would have a child. Some things are made known to us on a lower key, such as Yocheved's birth and her subsequent giving birth to Moshe. Also, at what, our at what our conventional wisdom would say is an advanced age. The Ikar of Amunah here, the core element of faith that these figures in Chumash are highlighting for us, it seems, is to know that we have what we need. God does not come to us with challenges that we're, we cannot withstand. God does not leave us unequipped by, with the means to go forward. Whether it's Serach Bat Asher's gifts of prophecy and music and song, or Yocheved's lesson of how important just being there really is, we're left to contemplate and appreciate the spiritual riches that we have and ask ourselves, what are we doing to make maximum use of them? As we're in the Shabbos now that precedes the fast of the 10th of Teves, when we commemorate the very beginnings of the siege of Jerusalem, which led to the destruction of the temple and the exile that followed, we can use this precious time for introspection and positive resolutions to deepen ourselves in the confidence and vision to know that what God, what God equips us with and to use all that we have to make the most out of even the most draining, the most disheartening situations, the most demoralizing uh, times, the most seemingly desolate. As we went into uh, exile and the mother of Moshe was born, who knows what great ideas, people and movements are being born at this very moment around us. We trust and we know that we have and we will have everything we need to survive and to thrive. Good Shabbos.